We're talking about direct sum problem uh, in the streaming model. Uh, and this is joint work with Anubra. Let me just start you by reminding you about the direct sum problem. So the direct sum problem just asks whether if you perform k computations, k independent computations in parallel, whether they require k times more resources, or is there a clever way to somehow combine the computations so that you can save on the resources. So we want to study this problem in the streaming setting. And uh, for, for, so for that, let me remind you about the model. So a streaming algorithm doesn't see its whole input at once. The inputs arrive in an online fashion. Uh, first, some part of the input arrives x1. That streaming algorithm computes something and stores it in memory. Then the next part arrives, and the streaming algorithm computes something else based on its previous memory state and this input. And this process goes on until it sees the whole input and computes some function. So throughout this talk, I'm going to assume that the inputs come from some distribution. So there is some joint distribution on x1 to xn from which the inputs are sampled. And the algorithms uh, might be randomized, so they might toss independent random coins at each step to compute the answer. Uh, so the standard measure of complexity of a streaming algorithm is the maximum memory used by the algorithm at any time step. So you measure what is the maximum uh, size of each of these memory states that you need to store. So here is a simple example of a function being computed in the streaming model. So consider this function, the LH frequency moment function, which has been considered a lot in the streaming literature. So the input stream is just numbers from 1 to n. And the frequency of, an, in a, of a number a in the stream is just how many times it appears. And you want to uh, take it to the Lth power and compute the sum. Okay. So you can, so, so here I'm going to just do it in the trivial way. So you just store a big table of how many times you have seen each, and each element in the stream. And at the end, you have a count of all the elements. And you just compute this function. And this trivial algorithm, it, can, it requires memory and log n at every time step just to store this table. And uh, from a big line of research in the streaming literature, this bound is almost tight, even for approximating this function. So I hope the model is clear enough, even for people who are not familiar with it. And, okay. and if you have any questions, please ask. So now we want to study the direct sum problem in this model. So now the streams, they come in parallel. So there are k streams, and they come in parallel. So at the first time step, you see the first element of each of the streams, and you compute something. The next time step, you see the second element. And this goes on until you compute the function on all the streams. Okay. And the question we want to ask if is that if these k streams, they're sampled independently and identically from some distribution, whether uh, computing this function, the k copies of the function, it requires k times more memory. So it turns out that it's a little bit subtle to define, to formalize this question in this model. So here is an example which is very illustrative in this respect. So consider the following distribution on the inputs. So you, you have a stream of length n. You randomly choose a block of n over k cubed inputs where there is actual data. Otherwise, the stream is all zeros. So now if you sample k streams from this distribution, Independently, independently, then with high probability, they're going to look like this. So with high probability, when there is data in one stream, there will be no data in any other stream. And, and so now you can run your algorithm that computes the function on a single stream independently on each of the streams. And when you're processing one stream, then no, I mean, no other stream requires any processing. So the maximum memory used by uh, this uh, this straightforward way of computing each, computing f on each stream individually will not increase at all. Question: Why would you be interested in the distribution dependent setting as opposed to the just say compute all the k streams without having to worry about distribution? 
The original problem didn't care about distributions either. It just said it's a stream and just compute the. Yeah, but then the algorithms are randomized, right? So here we are considering, like, I mean. The, so you're pointing to the hardness of proving lower bounds for this as opposed to, uh, yeah, and that's why you're saying there's some yeah. subtlety to defining the distribution. Yeah. Oh. Well, I mean, also this is what we can prove. So, yeah. So, you know, if you can prove something about worst case, then, yeah. you know. No, I wasn't sure thing. what the origin. Okay, well, well, why this was thing? Okay, now I know. I'm not even sure. So you're done dealing with stream one. Mm -hmm. So you just compute the answer, and answer requires very little memory. So that's like. So you, it's not that at the end you have to provide all the answers. Uh, no, at the end you have to compute all the answers. Uh, so. The answers require I mean, very little memory. Very little memory. So you can just store the answers and carry it through. Okay. <clears throat> so, I hope things are clear now. Uh, so, but something else is going on in this example. If you look more closely, you see that. I mean, you're still processing K streams, so like the average memory per time step required to compute this function is still increases by a factor of K because you still you're doing like K times more processing. So essentially, this is the question we want to study, whether with this complexity measure, the direct sum a problem uh, holds. Okay. So let me define it more formally. So the average memory used to, is just a so you take the expectation over the inputs and the randomness used by the algorithm, and this is just the total memory for every time step, and then you just scale it by the number of time steps. So this is the formal definition. Okay. So in this example, these are all zeros, right? So you don't you have very little memory that you want to. When you say only blocks of zeros, you don't use any memory at all for those things. But in this case, is it? that it increases by k. It doesn't for this example, right? It increases by k because, I mean, this is just the total memory used by the algorithm. So here you're using the memory for just one stream. Here using, I mean, here using the same amount of memory for the same stream. So in the end, you, I mean, the total memory, it increases by a factor of k. Okay. Right. Uh, so another, I mean, so this is a particularly natural complexity measure to consider in it by itself. And in fact, some known streaming lower bound already give you lower bounds for average memory. So, so we want to study whether, if you want to compute a function on k streams in parallel, whether the average memory increases by k. So let me now come to the main theorem that we prove, just following. If your input stream x1 to xn is independent, and you require memory m to compute the function on single stream, then for k streams, the memory required is this quantity. It might be even feared, so let me explain it. So when the number of streams is really large, k is really large, then and the memory required to compute the function on a single stream is at least n, then you get something non-trivial here. I will discuss at the end about like uh, possibly improving the parameters and open questions related to that at the end. So this is what we prove. And in the rest of this talk, I'm going to give you a proof of this theorem. And for that, I need one basic fact from information theory. To, to understand, k needs to be bigger than n. To be yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it could be, uh, I mean, it could be very large. It could be n cubed or things like that. So. No, no, no. So we're measuring the average memory. So uh, you see, the average memory can be a number that's smaller than 1. And it's still not trivial. Oh, we're, we're scaling everything. You know, if if your algorithm uses one, you know, ten bits of memory in some place, well, then you're saying that for a, if there was a single stream and the 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 true answer is m over n, not m, right? The average memory. When you say m is the memory needed, that's not the average. Memory. No, no, no is the average. The memory is m over n. No, no, it's the average memory. So, sorry, sorry. For the rest of this talk, whenever I say memory, I will mean average memory now. So. This oh, is, okay, then, then yeah. Ah, okay. So in that case, yeah, so K needs to be bigger than. K needs to be bigger than N. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the basic fact from information theory that I need is just the super additivity of mutual information, which is that if you have n random variables which are independent, condition on Z, then the mutual information between 
all of them and y condition on z is at least the mutual information between each of them and y condition on z. So let me start with the proof. So the high level outline is this. We're just going to argue by contradiction. So suppose we have like, this magical algorithm for k streams that uses very small memory. And then we are going to use this algorithm to design an algorithm that computes f on a single stream uh, with small memory. And I mean, this is a contradiction because m is the minimum amount of memory required to compute the function on a single stream. Okay. There are several steps in the, in the proof. So first, we are going to argue that if your algorithm uses very little memory uh, and computes the answer on all k streams, there is some stream about which it cannot remember uh, much information. So for this, you need to define a measure of complexity for uh, an information measure for streaming algorithms. And here is one very natural measure that we define and use. It's, we call it the transitional information content. So essentially, you take the mutual information between the memory at time t and the input at time t, conditioned on the previous memory state. And then you take the average over all the time steps. So in words, this is essentially the average amount of information the algorithm learns about the next input based on what it already knows. One easy to see fact is that this is bounded by the average memory. Okay. So let me come to the step one of the proof now. So just by super additivity, the mutual information between the memory at time t and the tth element of all the k streams, these represent, I mean, the sub superscript represent the streams, is at least the mutual information between the memory at time t and the tth element of each stream. So now just by averaging, you get that there is some stream for which uh, the algorithm remembers, learns very little information conditioned on what it already knows. And this is bounded by the information content divided by k, which is at most the memory divided by k. So this, so coming back to our plan, now we know this fact, that there is some stream about which the algorithm remembers very little information. And we are going to use this fact to design a randomized algorithm that computes the function on a single stream. And it might still use very large memory, so it won't give us a contradiction, but it will have small information content. And I mean, to do this, there is also a very natural way. So you want, the basic idea is you want to, you have this uh, magical parallel algorithm that uses very little memory, and you want to somehow run it with a single stream. So you do the natural thing. You take your input stream. You embed it at this location about which the algorithm stores very little information. Okay. Uh, sorry, what's the question? And you generate other streams randomly. And so all the I mean, everything is independent here, so you can do this, in fact. And then you just run the algorithm for k streams. And it outputs the answer on all the streams, and then you just output the jth answer. And from what we saw before, uh, the information content of this algorithm is bounded by this number. It's small. So coming back to our plan, now we have a randomized algorithm that computes the f function on a single stream with small information. And the last step is to compress this algorithm. By which I mean that to show that if you if you have a streaming algorithm which has small information content, then you can somehow simulate it with small memory. Question now, since there are no questions. So what we want to do here is that here we have our original algorithm which gets some input, stores something in memory, and what we want to do is that we want to store something that breaks the dependency between x1 and m1, which we could store. So somehow, uh, this w1 that we want to store, it breaks the dependency and it, it, it exactly extracts the information about x1 that we need to carry on rest of the simulation. Okay. And I mean, if we have this, we can just repeat this for rest of the steps and we'll have an error-free simulation. So let me just like repeat this fact. So what we want is that uh, our inputs are coming from some distribution, x1. So let x1 be the random variable for that. And m1 is the random variable denoting the memory. And we want a random variable w1 that kind of 
makes them independent. And once you have that, you can just store that and you can forget about X1 because you have all the information that you need, essentially. And W1 should be short. Yeah, and, and it, it would help if W1 is short. That's what we actually require. So here is a very natural attempt once you see that you want this. Uh, so you, you can ask this question that given any random variables x and m, is there another random variable w such that w makes x and n independent and the entropy of w is small? So w requires about the mutual information between x and m that's to store. Okay. So as you might guess from the title of the slide that this is not true. So this, uh, this question was studied by Weiner long back under the guise of common information. And I mean, there are many known examples where the mutual information between random variables is one bit, but the entropy of w, any w which makes them independent can be arbitrarily large. Okay. But all is not lost because something very close is actually true. So it's possible to do this with some additional randomness. And this was done in a beautiful paper by Harsha, Jan, McAllister, and Radhakrishnan from 2010. And another alternate sampling procedure was given by Braverman and Garg a couple of years ago. So what they prove is the following. So for any random variables x and m, there exist two random variables c and s, such that s is independent of x. So you can think of s as some kind of randomness which is independent of x, so you can sample it ahead of time and use it. And C and S, they together break the dependency between x and m. And in fact, something stronger is true in, in these in this, uh, proofs. That C and S, they actually determine the value of m. And lastly, I mean, the entropy of C condition on the randomness is small, so C requires small number of bits to store once you have the randomness. Like your CS, you just mean the... Yeah, it's just a concatenation of them. Okay, so this is very close to what we wanted. So let's go back to our proof. Sorry? S is randomness, so it's just like you can sample it and it's size does not really matter. I mean, and it's going to be infinite in this case. It has infinite support. So, so let's plug this back in, in what we want. So the first step, we're just going to use uh, uh, this random variable C1 that is given by the reconstruction. And this requires some randomness which, can, which you can sample ahead of time. And together, these, the C1 and the randomness, they determine the value of M1 that you want. So in the next step, you just sample condition on the value of this M1. And you can just repeat this until you reach that end. And this is an error-free simulation of uh, the algorithm on top. But there is uh, something uh, that you have to be careful about here is that at any time t, you need to remember the entire history of what you uh, had, had sampled before. So you need to remember all the C1 to Cd. That is because at any time step C, uh, t, your sampling condition on the previous memory state, which is only determined once you know the previous Cd and this kind of cascades, and you need to remember the entire thing. So essentially, in this case, you need to remember the entire history of what you are sampling in order to be able to do this simulation. So also, as given by uh, the uh, lemma of Harsha et al. and Braverman and Garg, the entropy of this, uh, each of these encodings, what you're storing is about the mutual information between xt, mt, and condition on the previous memory state. And once you have this, we can uh, see that at any time t, uh, storing all of c1 to c3, uh, ct requires this many bits. and uh, just by plugging in the expressions we have, uh, we get the following compression lemma, that if you have a streaming algorithm with information content i, then you can simulate it with memory n times i, essentially. So now you might think that uh, there could be some hope of uh, saving up this blow up of n here, 
but it turns out that this compression lemma is tied for this information measure. So here is a very simple example. Okay. So your inputs x1 to xn, they're random bits. And your algorithm just stores them and outputs them at the end. So it's just doing something very stupid. But so this algorithm, it remembers, it learns one bit of information about the next input at every time step, which means that the average information learned is also one bit at every time step. But you cannot hope to kind of output x1 to xn without, remember, without using omega and average memory. Okay. So the compression, the dilemma that we had was almost tight. And so, but we, now we can go back to our proof of the right sum and we can plug this in. So we had a randomized algorithm that computed f, but it used small uh, information. And using this compression, uh, you get an algorithm that computes f on a single stream and uses memory less than m. I mean, the parameters here are chosen like carefully to cancel everything. So, so this concludes the proof. This is the theorem restated. Okay. Okay, so now you can ask that whether uh, how can you go about improving the parameters in this theorem? And for that, you, I mean, if you want to use the same approach, you might think of using like a different information measure, which allows you to do better compressions. Okay. So another measure of information that he, that is very natural to define and is what we call the cumulative information content. It's essentially, you look at the mutual information between the memory at any time and all the inputs it has seen so far, and you take the average. So in other words, this is essentially the average amount of information the algorithm retains about all the inputs it, it has seen so far. And we show that it, the direct sum argument goes through for even for this information measure. So if you can compress, you will get optimal direct sum theorems in this setting. So essentially, if you have an algorithm which has cumulative information content i, and it can be simulated with order i memory, then memory required for k streams will be k times more, even when the memory is constant. Memory for a single stream is constant. And essentially, that brings me to the end. And I will, there is a natural open problem related to this question, which is compression to cumulative information content. So we have an algorithm that we believe could, could actually compress to cumulative information content, possibly. But we are not able to analyze it. So it's there in the paper if you want to take a look. And another natural question is, I mean, whether the direct sum question, to improve the parameters for direct sum question for independent distributions, and then to somehow prove direct sum theorems for arbitrary distributions. Although this looks pretty hard because it's not clear how to carry the direct sum arguments when the streams are correlated. And uh, I'm going to give you another open problem, which is just a purely information theory question. It's related to analyzing the candidate algorithm that we have. And I'm not going to give you any details on how, how it's related, but I'm just, let you, I'm just going to let you stare at this. So we, had, we, so we know already this, that for any random variables x and m, there exists random variable c, s, such that s is randomness independent of x. They break the dependency, and the entropy of c is small. So now we want to ask whether this additional condition is true. If, if you have another random variable which is independent uh, of x once you know m, then this, uh, uh, I mean, this construction of c and s, uh, they do not give you more information than what you should in this case, which is the mutual information between x and n. And if you want to ba map it back to the streaming algorithm setting, then it's essentially m is the current memory step, and n is going to be the next memory step. So you want to somehow take that into account. I think that's all I have to say. So thank you all very much for listening, and 